Okay, everybody, the time is here. The time is now. Overwatch Season 6 is in full swing. It's got a bevy of new content to offer, and I'm here to talk about it. You know, to take a look at all the big new updates and to let you know if this is all it's cracked up to be or if it falls short. And there is a lot here, so let's just go ahead and get into it. Now, the first thing I'll say is that the devs weren't kidding when they said that this is their biggest season so far. It definitely is, and I'm happy to say it actually feels like it when you get on to play, especially if you opted to pay for the story content. And speaking of the story missions, let's talk about those. By now, we all know the Overwatch 2 story missions are just a hollow shell of what was once promised, but even knowing that going into this didn't mean that they had to be bad. But now that we've got our hands on it, how is it? Well, I've played the three available story missions multiple times on multiple difficulties, and I think they're okay. Maybe even a little better than okay, just a little. When you consider everything and take in all factors, I think that these are okay. We all know these should have been free, and they sort of blindsided people with a $15 price tag, especially coming fresh off the announcement that these story missions would be a lot less than what they promised. But even with the injustice of me having to pay $15, to access these factored in, I think they're okay. Don't get me wrong, I still think these should have been free and it's kind of just a greedy move on Overwatch's part, but at the very least, I didn't feel horribly shortchanged at the end of it all. So what are the story missions exactly? What's the layout? How do they work? Well, what I and likely many others thought this would be was a sort of bigger version of something like the Junkenstein's Revenge events. And yeah, it kinda is, but I think it's a little bit bigger than we anticipated and quite a tad bit more well thought out. So what happens? Well, when you select a mission and a difficulty, you will then be match made with three other players. That's assuming you're not already playing with the party. And you can also just be partied up with bot players if the game can't find players quickly enough so that you're not just sitting there waiting forever. This happened to me on the third and final mission where I had two bots and one real player. And note that I played these missions pretty much as soon as they came out, so it's possible that a lot of people just hadn't reached the third mission yet. Anyway, once you're all match made up, you get to choose from a roster of limited predetermined heroes that varies and is specific to each mission. For example, Mission 2 has about 10 heroes that you can choose from, whereas Mission 3 only has 4. So yeah, you guys choose your heroes and it's pretty standard co-op stuff from there. You go through a linear mission path, killing robots and completing objectives in what takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the mission. And I have to say, these missions are surprisingly varied in execution. You're not really doing the exact same thing from mission to mission, and each mission also introduces a new enemy type. Although I do wonder how long they can keep that up going forward as new missions get added, but in terms of variety using the tools at hand, they did a good job with these first three missions. Now, these are story missions, and so a lot of the value lies within the lore and the characters. And all throughout these missions, you'll get to hear heroes interact with each other and even have very specific, very missable lines that only pertain to a specific combination of heroes. And this kind of thing, as well as the actual cutscenes at the beginning and end of every mission, are a great start and payoff to Overwatch fans who have been playing for years years and seeing the lore held up as this important thing, but now you finally get to see it move forward. I feel for a lot of longtime fans, they've waited to see the characters in this capacity, and it does feel satisfying to a degree. And the final cutscene in the third mission genuinely makes me excited for more story missions. Unfortunately, where this all sort of falls down a bit is in the replayability of it all. There really aren't any great reasons to do any of the missions again unless you just sort of want to. There are some rewards for ramping up the difficulty of the missions, but the rewards are pretty bad. It's just sprays of no sector omnics and a couple of hero voice lines. Not a great reason to go back for another 30 minutes of the exact same thing that you just did. There is a lore value to doing the missions over, but again, it's not great. So for every mission that any given character is playable in, they have a data slash chat log that can be 
unlocked as a little additional bit of flavor regarding that character. And you unlock these by playing as the character in the missions they're available in. So for instance, Reinhardt is playable in all three missions. So he has three unlockable data logs with one unlocking for every time you play as him in a unique mission. And like I said, it's some fun flavoring, but it doesn't really make for the best replay incentive. I feel like after you complete the missions once, you should unlock the full hero roster for that mission and be able to play with characters that are not canon to that event. And maybe a character who is canonically there handles all the important mission dialogue via voice comms or something. That way you don't have to record the specific mission dialogue with every single hero every time a mission comes out. I don't know, something to think about. I hope an Overwatch dev magically hears this. Also, completing the mission once should unlock the option to use your character skins in the story because as of right now, you just can't. Another option I think maybe should be in here is some sort of score system, possibly where you get an individual score and a team score per run through of any mission. Something as simple as that does a lot to encourage replayability, just ask Pac-Man. Point is the replayability is not great and is the biggest anchor weighing down what otherwise is a solid start to the PVE branch of Overwatch Live Service. But all right, those are some of my story mission thoughts. Let's talk about other new season six stuff. Let's talk about the new hero, Ilari. You've probably already been seeing a lot of people talk about her, but me being me, I'm actually gonna give you the truth. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, yeah, this character has come out strong, true enough. However, she's not the outrageously OP monster that some would have you believe. So let's get into the specifics and we'll start off with her healing because she is a support after all. Her healing is pretty crazy, can't lie. It's efficient, it's easy, it's fast. Ilari has a healing pylon, which is essentially a little node that she places that will automatically heal teammates when they're near it. Perfect for holding the line, especially if your tank actually knows where the fuck to stand. You just place the pylon behind something or around a corner and your team is getting a constant drip feed of health that the opponents more or less can't do anything about. Now I say they can't do anything about it, but I mean they can't do anything about it if you place it where they can't see it without going through your team. In actuality, the pylon can be destroyed. It's got 150 health with half of that health being shield health, but all it takes is a half decent placement and your team is eating good. Not to mention the pylon sticks to walls and ceilings and whatever the fuck else you can think of. Ilari's other source of healing is her secondary fire, which fires a bright yellow cement Metra-esque beam that heals absolutely fast as shit, to the point that it can be tough to fight through if you're on the opposing side, let alone if her pylon is out alongside her healing beam. Now the thing about this powerful beam is that it's on an overheat gauge of sorts, where as long as you don't completely empty it out, it recovers pretty quickly. But if you do empty it out slash overheat it, then you're locked out of using it until it recharges, which is about 4 seconds, which is also the same amount of time you could shoot the beam from max charge before it's empty. So when using her secondary fire, you're kind of teeter-tottering, playing this balancing act, trying not to slip up and get as close to the edge as possible without going over, you know? Might sound a little troublesome, but it's actually pretty easy. Like I said, her healing's insane, and because of the ease of it, she can be tough to keep up with if you're going for top healing that game. But now, let's look at her damage options, because this is more so what has people in a tizzy. Now as far as options go, there's really only one, her primary fire. But it's the power that that primary fire has behind it. So Ilari's primary is this auto charging gun that builds in power over about one and a half seconds. Think about how Sojourn's ult charges her railgun. It works like that, but on a much weaker scale. So if you're taking that 1.5 seconds between shots for a slower firing rate, you're doing about 75 damage a shot as opposed to 
the 25 to 50 you'd be doing otherwise. All of which crits on headshots for damage and a half. So just a couple of well placed shots can put the majority of characters either in the dirt or at least in a whole heap of trouble. Sounds pretty nuts when combined with her wild healing I mentioned before, but keep in mind those shots do have to be well placed and oftentimes you're gonna find you're not as strong as the hype would suggest and going toe to toe with the DPS characters is gonna prove more trouble than it's worth more times than not. However, Ilari's ultimate is also a fully offensive ability. First off, during her ult, she can fly, not unlike Sigma. This is mostly so she can hit as many people as possible with her ult. Once she's in the air, when she's ready, she can launch some sort of sun blast that explodes in a decently wide radius, doing damage and marking anybody hit as sunstruck. Anyone sunstruck is slowed, and if they take 120 damage while sunstruck, they will explode for an additional 120. 20 damage and the sunstruck explosion can damage other nearby enemies and also trigger another sunstrike. So the plan with her ult is to set off this chain reaction of slow exploding morons to be killed by your team. It's a good ult and it's definitely on a spectrum depending on which character you are being sunstruck can feel absolutely hopeless like there's no possible way to survive but then there are other characters that make you feel like you can ignore her ult altogether. It honestly doesn't feel like too troublesome of an ultimate ability, but also good enough to be effective. Now here's where all that OP talk really goes out of the window. When you take into account her very underwhelming movement ability. For Ilari's movement option, she does this wide sunburst that thrusts you at not exactly breakneck speeds in the direction that you're moving, while also making you airborne. The height you can go is a little less than as high as sojourn slide jump. Also, when Alari activates this burst, enemies are knocked back, making it a nice little group displacement tool. However, it's the idea of this as an escape tool to attempt to ensure your survivability where its shortcomings become apparent. The thing that makes Sojourn Slide Jump such a good escape is how fast the slide is and how wide the window is for her to initiate the jump during it. The combination of speed and inconsistent launch timing makes her hard to track during the ability. Whereas Ilari's outburst ability doesn't move you very quickly or take you very far. It's really easy to have a great estimation of where she is when she does does this and so she's really fucking easy to focus and hunt specifically for tanks who can take more than a few hits and nullify some of her knockback. I've experienced it firsthand. If a tank wants to kill you as a Lari and your team doesn't have awareness enough to try and protect you, you're gonna die. No if, ands, or buts about it. It's really not hard for anyone to bully and harass a Lari, but it's remarkably easy for tanks. Her escapability is far from primo shit. People are just caught in the glitz and glamour of a new character and are still learning, but once they learn you will be hunted and when you are you'll want to be a different character. <laughs> so in summation, I feel like you take high burst damage comparable to Baptiste and mix it with Moira's ability to easily dish out both damage and healing while removing any of the utility that Baptiste or anyone else for that matter has, as well as removing the fantastic escape of a character like Moira and you have Ilari. A quick hitting, heavy healing character with low escapability and next to zero utility. All in all, I think she's a cool character. If I had to guess what nerfs are coming her way, I'd say the speed of her secondary fire healing, but your guess is as good as mine, if not better. But okay, that's Ilari, we're done with that. And so now, I suppose the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the new game, Flashpoint. So Flashpoint is a game mode where a capture point will spawn randomly in one of a few designated areas of a map. Obviously, both teams head over and try to capture that point and try to hold it until it's charged to 100%. Once one team does that, a new point will appear somewhere around the map and you repeat the process. The first team to capture three points wins. Cool. Sounds all well and dandy. I'll be honest, 
I don't like it. <laughs> it's extremely chaotic and I don't like it. Listen, as a person who's played a lot of Overwatch, I can tell you it's hard as hell to get your team to focus the objective. These people already think the game is Call of Duty. They already play every game mode like it's deathmatch. So what happens when that stationary or slowly plotting predictable objective is now randomly poofing around? all hell breaks loose. I think the worst part is that a lot of the areas that the point will appear in are really wide, almost like little battle arenas. And the actual point is just a small zone within the center of this miniature battle arena. They almost feel like halo maps once you arrive at the point. So people are just running around all over the place, fighting in every direction. And it feels like the least team oriented Overwatch has ever been. And you know, one team will capture a point or something, so your whole team will be heading to the next one. But since there aren't these mostly singular linear directions opposite each other for each team to come down, you'll be walking with your team and see one member of the enemy team across the way from you. And that temptation is too much for many to handle. So you just end up with two or three members of your team deciding to chase someone instead of head to the point. And when you arrive at the point, the pieces of your team that showed up just get murked. It's fucking insane. I found this game mode insanely infuriating, but I have hope that once it comes to competitive play, it will be a little more focused and a lot less chaotic and irritating, but that's really all I can hope for. The base of the Overwatch players are scatterbrained as shit and are convinced that every first person shooter is Call of Duty, and Flashpoint accentuates that to an unbearable degree for me, but maybe it's just me. So I don't really think Flashpoint is bad, but the player base's mentality is not conducive to the movement freedom of the Flashpoint maps. Anyway though, I do want to point out the new Hero Mastery. This is probably the most underrated update of the season for me. I love the heroes having individual levels and their individual abilities and whatnot also having levels. So, you know, you can be like a level 10 Kiriko or something we'll say. But your overall healing also has an individual level and your debuffs cleansed has its own level as well critical hits have a level, all of that. So people can see which characters you play based on the level, but also how you in particular play them, or at least get some idea of that. So yeah, I think that's really cool, a super dope inclusion. And I just wanted to shout that out really quickly. But yeah, the season obviously just started, so there's still a bunch of stuff to come, but I think it's looking mostly really good so far. But the question for me is, how often can we expect story missions? Will they be every other season like the hero? or will they always launch alongside a hero or do they plan to alternate because if they plan to alternate then next season would likely be the only season we'd get two story mission packs in a row or maybe they plan to drop one story mission every season and this first drop is the only time we'll get three at once in which case we could assume the missions would cost five dollars i don't know man i'm just wondering about all this it feels like it would be a little kooky to charge $15 alongside the $10 you're already paying for the battle pass every season. That seems kind of fucking crazy. They might have to change that if that's the plan. But yeah, clearly season six saw a significant content dump but how do you properly continually dish it out going forward? The language that Overwatch devs have been using in interviews and stuff like that lately suggests that they feel they found their footing and now have a more clear cut sense of content releases and their live service identity, but who knows? All that can just be bluster, only time will tell. I originally thought that season six would kind of reveal the answers to Overwatch's future, but now that it's here it doesn't feel so definitive because yes i think it's good and it's a good step but are we going to get consistently good seasons and content releases or will we have to wait every few seasons or even more maybe we have to wait every six seasons for one big one who the hell knows like, you know I, I guess we'll have to see what kind of habits they're forming in season seven maybe that'll be the 
true revealer. Who knows? So, okay, that's it. That's all I've got. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, please remember to like and maybe even possibly subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. Also, don't forget to do your favorite thing. Hop in the comments and tell me how stupid and wrong I am. But no matter what you do, thanks for watching. Until next time, I am Waifu Belector. I am just a normal guy. I like hentai and I want you to play the objective. Goodbye.